Welcome to Tea Time with Brian. My guest today is George Thompson, and you may have seen him in his recent movie called Journey to the East, which is really good. If you haven't seen it, please go to YouTube and check it out. I think you'll really find it interesting. But it was his video series that actually drew me to him first and asked him to uh, join me today. And as a story will ultimately lead to your time in China, can you kind of give us a, a background of how you were prior to, to going to China? Yeah, so my journey kind of started after finishing university and finishing formal education and leaving, leaving the, the formal constraints of having goals set for me and having some structure in my life. And so I started working for myself just after graduating, entering the big bad world and realizing that, um, yeah, there's kind of quite a lot of work that I needed to do on myself to be able to stay resilient and functioning. I started my YouTube channel and I had an interest in filmmaking uh, for a long time. And yeah, I started working for myself, but found was quickly procrastinating and descending into self-critical thinking about the sort of videos that I was making and beating myself up for not feeling good enough, which then quickly graduated into anxiety, sleeping in, feeling sick all day. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I'd say that I, I've always kind of had a curiosity about how I work. And, and I said to myself at the time, like, if I can't handle this, which on, on the surface level was just spending a month by myself and descending into the kind of toughest mental health crisis of my life so far, then how was I supposed to handle the big stuff? So yeah, that kind of set the groundwork for needing to do some work to learn how to be kinder to myself. When you say you were working for yourself, what were you doing? So I'd started the YouTube channel, which was still just making videos and I was delivering food um, on my bike for money. Um, oh. But yeah, sort of starting my filmmaking journey at that point. Okay. I think it's depressing that usually your harshest critic ends up being yourself. And yeah, the internal yeah. dialogue, it, it's, I don't know where it comes from, but you know, you do, you, you beat yourself up for no reason because other people aren't taking the time to do it. It's just you doing it. Yes. Yes. I, I personified my inner critic as the underminer, the voice in my head that brings me down and gives me pain. And I've personified it as a little wizard, an evil wizard that is always kind of on my shoulder telling me what I've done wrong. Uh, and so, yeah, one of the things I've learned over this journey is how to cohabit with the underminer and, and, and to laugh at some of the silly things that he comes up with, because they are often very silly. That's great. We'll uh, loop back to that later, I'm sure. Um, what was it about China that um, brought you to it? Yeah, so I'd say that I've always kind of been spiritual, but not religious. I talked to Jesus when I was nine and went to church uh, most weeks, but kind of fell out of the church in my teenage years and was kind of an atheist, but always kind of had a sense of the wow for nature and for, for existence. and really the china was i had some vague idea of the wisdom there more actually zen buddhism than taoism um, but in particular i'd watch some videos of some kung fu monks doing flips and bashing things with their, their wrists and doing all this crazy stuff and i thought at the time i needed some discipline and maybe some meditation could help me so that was kind of my way into china was the kung fu culture and in particular between kind of Shaolin and Wudang, which are the two most famous types of Kung Fu, Shaolin kind of being the more acrobatic and martial, and then Wudang being more internal about qi cultivation and meditation. And so that kind of latter world seemed to pique my interest, even kind of in this state of ignorance of not knowing really anything about either of the cultures. That's cool. And then you know, obviously you went there and you had your experience, but We'll get to those here in a minute. In your film, though, what I liked about it was rather than just flying into there, and obviously you had a really weird time of traveling just because of what was going on in the world. Um, I liked the uh, the train journey because, it, it, like you said, it, it really brought a, um, a distance to, to the world. It's lacking, but your uh, time in Irkutsk looked like it was pretty amazing. Um, can you kind of tell the background to that and you know, what, what happened for the people who haven't seen the, the movie? Yeah, so I first went to China four years ago and yeah, kind of had an adventure of, of meeting my now Tai Chi master and 
exploring the philosophy of Taoism, uh, which is the yin yang, ancient Chinese philosophy, a beautiful philosophy I'm sure we'll talk about. And then I came back to kind of the UK and then, yes, decided to continue my learning and, and to try and get deeper. And I was keen to not fly because I, I kind of wanted to get a sense of how big our world is and how the nature and the culture changes on your journey. Because when you take a flight, you know, what do you do? You watch a low res film, you eat some bad food and you have a snooze and you arrive. Whereas on the train, it, it solid from London to Beijing is, is 14 days of solid train travel. And it took me around three weeks to get to Vladivostok, the, to the very far east of the Eurasian continent. And yeah, you, you really do just get a sense for the scale of our planet and how the cultures change. So Irkutsk is, I believe, the capital of Siberia, if not the capital of Buryatia, um, which is the kind of one of the states in the Russian Federation. And yeah, the average winter temperature there, and I went in February, is minus 25 degrees centigrade. And I don't know how warm that is in Fahrenheit, but it's, you know, it's cold. well <laughs> below freezing. <laughs> it's very cold. And so it, it's just a really different world out there. It's a remote land of ice. And I stayed on an island on, on a frozen lake. And, and the lake, uh, yeah, the ice was one and a half meters thick. So th thick that they had motorways running across it. It was their main form of transport. And, and so, yeah, it's, it, it's very different. And I arrived and met a shaman, uh, which was a real privilege. Someone who kind of was the kind of manifestation of the spiritual wisdom of, of, the, of that people and that area. And something that really struck me is that because the nature is so powerful, so cold, you can't help but have a relationship with it. And that's as compared to, you know, me in the city now where, you know, I can kind of see the clouds however many meters away, but nothing much beyond that. And so, yeah, I, I think that the, the kind of the philosophy of the shamans that I, I met was that, you know, we are part of nature and not superior to it uh, and, and connected to it. And, and there's some lovely metaphors coming from the shaman of, of, you know, if we continue to act in a way that we are destroying the foundations of our own civilization through destroying nature, then the waters of the lake, Lake Baikal, will rise up and flood everyone. And yeah, this kind of idea of a catastrophic flood repeats quite a lot through um, kind of mythology. You, you'll know about what the Epic of Gilgamesh and then Noah's Ark and, 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 and stories like these, which kind of when nature takes back over, essentially. Um, so, yeah, that was kind of the beginning of a reconnection to different ways of looking at the world, which were yeah, interesting and have many parallels with what the Taoists found in their experience in ancient China. Okay. Well, coming from a person who grew up in a place where lakes don't freeze over, it, it was... Um... It was really interesting to see you guys driving that car across a frozen lake to get get there. I'm not sure I would have enjoyed that part. <laughs> <laughs> yes, nerve wracking. <laughs> How did you end up meeting the shaman though? That's the part I'm curious about. Yeah, I, I doing research because I knew I was going to go out there. I wanted to have someone who was a local to guide me and I found some articles online and then I asked her if I could stay with her and she said, can't with me, but I've got a friend. The friend uh, was very generous and kind of he's learning English. And so we stayed together. And then he knew someone who knew someone who knew the shaman. <laughs> so we arrived and it was a tenuous link. Uh, but yeah, it, it was the kind of the, the local community shaman. So someone who would, you know, come in for fortune telling, coming in to reconnect people with their ancestors. So, you know, if you had some uh, connection you wanted to reopen with your grandmother, for example, he could help you do that and um, otherwise blessing buildings to make sure that there's no kind of spirits that are caught in there. So, yeah, even today, he is quite active in the community as someone who is kind of the spiritual leader and, and wise person of that community living on that island on the frozen lake. Okay. And um, for somebody who's not aware of the Trans-Siberian uh, Railway or Express, uh, how long of a journey is that to go from, say, Moscow to uh, Vladivostok? So, yeah, there's, it's a very famous train. I think it's the longest in the world, um, yeah, if not one of. 
and it runs from Moscow to Vladivostok. And that is like a commuter train that Russians do take. And it's only kind of the nuttier tourists that would take the whole thing. And if you were to do the whole thing across the whole of Russia, it would take you seven days. Yeah. And that's, you know, one train. It's, the, the other train is, is from Moscow to Beijing. And, and that is eight days, I believe, and also goes through Mongolia uh, and has fun bits like the, the, the widths of the tracks are different between Mongolia and China. And so you have the whole train lift up and they change the wheels for you. Uh, and so, yeah, quite, quite the adventure. It, that, that to me, I think would be absolutely fascinating to see. And then it'd be fascinating to see Mongolia. So, all right. So what I didn't realize it was that you made it to Vladivostok. So at that point, Russia had closed down the borders and you needed to, to fly in, which obviously wasn't your original intention, but um, kind of, uh, we'll make that our, our last segue of the movie before we get into the other, because I don't want to describe the whole thing, but uh, kind of describe what happened at that point. Hmm. Yeah, so I had planned this journey um, for February 2020 and I booked everything, visas, tickets, everything planned and kind of had this intention to reconnect with my Tai Chi master on the mountain in China. And it came to February, there was this thing called the coronavirus, it was still the China virus uh, and, and kind of in my ignorance uh, kind of imagined that, yeah, going there could be risky, but I could always turn back and, uh, you know, I wasn't bringing the virus to anyone. So I thought, you know, after lots of indecision uh, and literally on the morning of going, really considering not going, I decided to go and to try and see where the universe would take me. And so, yeah, I traveled across Russia. Um, but while I was still in Siberia, Russia closed, closed its borders with China. And so then on my next train, I tried to get to Vladivostok and then take a ferry to South Korea, but I found actually that ferry was cancelled while I was, you know, researching, borrowing other people's 4G, you know, Russian locals trying to get their internet. Um, and so I had to fly from Vladivostok to South Korea, and then I tried to get the ferry from South Korea to China. And that was closed as well because of coronavirus, eventually flying into Shanghai. I got in three days before, the, um, before China closed its borders. And so then was locked down in Shanghai for six weeks. Master Gu, who was in Hubei province, you know, a few hundred kilometers away from Wuhan. And, and the place I was heading is the Wudang Mountains and Wuhan, Wudang. This is the same Wu and the same kind of God overlooks both areas. So they are in Chinese terms pretty close. Um, so, yeah, Master Gu was locked down in his Tai Chi school and I'm kind of in Shanghai lockdown thinking I may never get in because Hubei may never open. Um, in the meantime, coronavirus spreads around the world. My family, five of them get the virus and I stay in, in, in Shanghai until the Chinese government do sort it out. You know, they, they close the borders, they locked everyone down and they, they managed to root out all of the coronavirus cases. And then, um, you know, seven weeks later, after the first lockdown, people were free again. Um, so that's when I managed to get into Hubei province and then finally to the mountain uh, where I then had this refuge, this safe space for the next nine months to practice and to get deeper into Taoism. I was going to say it looked like a good place to be during that time period because there weren't a whole lot of people around and yeah, it yes. didn't have a lot of ways to transmit the virus. <laughs> yes, exactly. Good, good nature time. It was, it was quiet. I just, I think that's fascinating. I wanted to bring that up because that's just not your normal, you know, every year travel to, to go there. That's a, a rather unusual set of circumstances that went along. I assume your family is okay though. Family is okay. Yes. And yeah, I think that, you know, Journey to the East as the kind of the summary film, it, it, it made ultimately my journey in the, in the film that I made from it much more kind of relevant because you know, it's just a basic reality that we are interdependent as different countries. You know, we have borders, but the virus crosses them uh, like, you know, our goods and services do and ideas do. And so the kind of the interdependence that the ancients found in many different wisdom traditions around the world between, you know, us not being separate from the world is even more true today, you know, with our globalization and technology. Uh, so it was an interesting 
you know, obviously, you know, a terrible year in many ways, but also a kind of very, very clear um, affirmation of our basic relationship with one another uh, and the planet. Yeah, I'll only say one more thing about the film, but that scene when you got back to Bristol, what time of the night was that when you were walking down the street? So, yeah, so I, I get back to, to Britain, it's in lockdown, it's 6 p.m. Normally, you know, like, should be everyone heading home yeah. and my, my city's empty. And, you know, like, I'd gone halfway across the world and then my home changes. So it's this weird kind of having to come back into what I thought would be my safe space, you know, like returning home. Um, but obviously the... The, the virus that had its first big outbreak in China had shut down my hometown. And so, yeah, very clear lesson of, of our interdependence. Yeah, if, if you, when you watch that movie, if you haven't, it's that scene to me really brought it homeless. It, it's like, I just, cause I, I mean, that's a fairly large city, but I mean, there's literally not a car, a person anywhere. And it's not like you're out in some rural part of, you know, the outskirts of town. I mean, this is, that was really bizarre. It was like you were in some, you know, like futuristic, you know, <laughs> movie or something. Yeah. The world of zombie film, yeah. yeah. It's really weird. Uh, th this this whole thing revolves uh, around Taoism. And I, I have to ask you the question that you can't really answer, which is what exactly is the Tao? <laughs> mm. Yes. So that is the the kind of the first question the first sensible question if if some someone is going to be talking about something called Taoism or Taoism you want to know what the Tao is to then explain the ism um, but yeah it's a difficult question so the the kind of the foundational text of Taoism is called the Tao Te Ching uh, or the Tao Te Ching depending on your spelling and the very opening lines of it is the Tao that can be named is not the eternal Tao and so the Tao is their word for the world or, or for the intelligence that animates this living universe uh, and the kind of the mysterious intelligence because you know really in the very opening lines they're saying the world that you describe you know if you describe this as how the world works abc that is not how the world works because it's too grand it's too mysterious to be able to be compartmentalized into a limited set of words using the human intellect and so, yeah, the Tao is, is the world, it's everything within it, but also the intelligence that animates it. And so, yeah, humanity has come up with different words to try and explain, you know, this, the fact that we can talk from the other side of the planet and the fact that we are alive and live in a, a living universe. Um, you know, that can be the, called the laws of nature, God's grace, Allah's will, Brahman. So there's different words for it. The Taoists, they called it the Tao. And it differs in, in sort of the kind of the metaphysical, the sort of the basic understanding of, of how the world works. And so for them, the Tao, there isn't anything outside of it. So there isn't an, an idea of an external power that then kind of sets the rules in motion that is kind of somehow separate. Instead, they believe that, you know, God or however you want to call it is, um, you know, part of the system and, and that the world is like an organism in the sense that it doesn't have a ruler. It, it, Drongza, who's the kind of the second most famous Taoist, has a great story about uh, the, the, the mouth and the ears and the nose and the stomach. They're all kind of having a chat one day. Uh, and the stomach, ears and mouth, they say, you know, stomach, all you do is just sit there. We feed you like the ears. We're listening out for threats. The nose we're smelling where the food is and the mouth. I'm having to chew every day. All you do is just sit there and, and get given stuff. We're going on strike. And so they stop eating, they stop hearing, they stop smelling. And they find that as the days progress, they have less and less energy, less and less energy until they die. And so, yeah, that's just a, a funny parable from Zhuangzi talking about, you know, is there a ruler? Is there a superior um, aspect or organ of the human organism? No, they all serve a function to create the, the overall functioning of our human bodies. Uh, and that is done without any kind of arbitrary, okay, we're going to smell this much today, we're going to chew this much today. Yeah. Each part of the organism just does it by itself. And so that is the kind of the idea of the Tao more generally, is that it is a self-creating system. It's like an organism that, that comes into being by itself. And it, you know, there's an obvious intelligence, the laws of nature that, that we see repeating in patterns throughout 
uh, the natural world. For example, the yin yang. Um, yeah, this is a uh, something that I show in some of the sessions that I do. Um, if podcast people will have to describe it, um, but this is a ammonite, a 200 million year old shelled creature that used to swim in the seas of Madagascar, and it has this Fibonacci sequence spiral. And we see this spiral throughout nature, hurricanes, galaxies, sunflowers of our heads. Uh, you'll see in, in young babies, we have this spiral feature. So the same laws of nature flow through all things, the plants and animals and, and all human beings. And so the, the Tao, the understanding of the Tao is, is, is a compassionate philosophy because it kind of places humanity as one part of the world and doesn't have any sort of idea that they over there are inferior and we are the superior chosen people by the higher power. Instead, you know, all of us share the basic um, intelligence that, that they called the Tao. Okay. So would it be a fair statement to say that there's a, a natural element to, to it or a connectedness? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, so the, the, the word for nature in Taoism is called Suran and it's made of two characters. Su is self, Ran is so. So their very word of nature is self, so that which comes into being by itself. Uh, and so, yeah, Taoism emerged from the forests of China, which have just an amazing abundance of, of wildlife and nature. And even today, one of the, the great joys for me of being on the mountain in China was that every walk I'd go on, I'd meet a new species, I'd meet bats, I'd meet flying squirrels, I'd meet monkeys, I'd meet a, a cacophony of, of insects. Uh, and so when you're kind of faced with that abundance of non-human consciousnesses, you can't help but realize that, you know, you are one part of the intelligence of the world. Uh, and so, yeah, I think that we kind of had an abundance that almost seems unbelievable to, to us now in sort of kind of the almost desertification of, of mm. uh, agriculture, um, certainly in the UK, who've lost, you know, even in just the last 50 years, much of its uh, wildlife. Uh, and so, yeah, nature is, is really the ground from which Taoism emerges. It is the, the, the kind of the method of discovery for the Taoists is being present in the world. And for them, that was, you know, being present in nature, which can continue to teach us a lot about who we are and, and how we relate to the world. Okay, so I'll have to ask, um, to take those principles in that environment, you could see that as being an easy application of it, maybe. I mean, I'm sure it's not easy. But if you were to take that back to Bristol, which I'm assuming is, you know, a lot more pavement buildings, things like that. I've never been there. So <laughs> bear with me. Yes. Um, how do you apply Taoism to a urban life? Yes. Yes. So, you know, in some ways, everything that we've done as humanity is one manifestation of nature because, you know, we are nature. Uh, and so the, the Taoists aren't necessarily anti-technological or anti-civilization. So the Tao Te Ching, the foundational text, is more agricultural and more like, you know, all this civilization, there's kind of the mirage of success and, you know, you gratifying your desires, but that's not going to lead to lasting contentment. All of these are kind of transitory um, successes and actually understanding how you work and realizing that you already have a lot of what you really need living a simple life can, can be better. Zhuangzi, the kind of second most famous Taoist, he, he places his, his, his kind of mouthpieces for his philosophies. So for example, a butcher, uh, for example, a bell stand maker. These are kind of skilled artisans in civilization in ancient China that he kind of uses to tell his stories about you know, what it means to live in keeping with the Tao. And so, yeah, you, you can be a Taoist and be in the city and, you know, the kind of the cat's out of the bag, in, in my opinion, of all of us returning back to agricultural ways of being. So, you know, in the way that I talk about Taoism is what's helped me. Uh, and, you know, I am a modern British person living in a city. And so if these ideas weren't relevant to life in the city, then, you know, it wouldn't be particularly helpful. But, it, you know, a lot of the principles do still apply. Uh, and, you know, meditation practices like Tai Chi and Qigong, they can help us kind of recenter and reground and remember our kind of natural being, which, which is, you know, an undeniable scientific fact that, you know, we, 
you know, we depend on the, the plants to give us food. We depend on the sun to energize the whole planet. We depend on the distant stars to stay far enough away or else we will be burned in their fiery inferno. Like we need all of those things in order to be alive. So they are surely just as much a part of us as our lungs and our hearts. You know, we are one part of nature. And, okay. and we can realize this with our, with our breath inhale and exhale this is you know the kind of connecting the inside of who we normally consider we ourselves to be and the outside and and the reality that we are intimately and unavoidably bound up with the outside world 99 percent of the air that we breathe came from plants uh, and so you know we live in this kind of beautiful symbiotic relationship where the trees create oxygen for us to breathe we use it and then we let out carbon dioxide, which they then use. And so, yeah, it is this cycle. And so, yeah, that's just one example of how to kind of develop these ideas and to internalize them into the story of who we are, even in the city. Okay. You mentioned breathing and I know to everybody that seems so obvious, right? Inhale, exhale type of thing, but there's an entire book and I can't remember the author's name on it. And after reading that, I'm not sure I believe that there's anything that's simple any longer because I was amazed at the amount of different things tied into breathing, whether it was through the nose, mouth closed, all, all those kinds of weird things. And meditation related to that is very popular now. People always tell you to do it, stuff like that. It, in at Wudong, what types of meditation did you um, do? Or how does somebody go about doing that, I guess I should say? Yeah. So people may have heard of Qigong, uh, which is, yeah, Qi, which is energy, because it's kind of reached English now. Gong means practice. So Qigong is energy practice. And there's kind of two main characteristics of Qigong. One is tranquility and the other is movement. And so for them, if you are kind of present with your body and moving, and that can be you know, physically moving your arms in Tai Chi or, or in repeated movements in Qigong, or it can be the internal movement of your breath, of your blood, of the movement of your organs. And so the kind of the basics of, of meditation is very simple in Taoism. And that is, you know, just being in the world rather than being in your head. And even the thoughts that come into your head can just be kind of flits of energy that are arising in the present moment. And so it's coming into the senses, coming into the body, uh, and that can be a teacher. And, and so yeah, the kind of the main forms of meditation is, is the kind of the more famous uh, kind of modes of meditation that came out of the Taoist culture is Tai Chi and Qigong, which are these beautiful moving meditations where you kind of repeat set moves, you exercise your body, it leads to kind of functional fitness because you're often quite low using the strength of your, your legs and moving in ways that you wouldn't normally. And then there's simple sitting meditation as well and, and so that can it has lots of different names so jingzuo is tranquility sitting uh, there's the standing meditation as well so a tree trunk standing um yeah there's lots of different approaches but was the book that you read breath by james nestor was it that book it, it was that title and i'm going to assume it was the author i, I don't remember at this point yes yeah because I've just just read that as well. It's you know the new science of forgotten art, or that's the subtitle of the book. And yeah, the, the kind of the, the one one useful breathing technique that I do throughout the day is in for four seconds, hold for seven, out for seven. Yeah. Uh, and there's something very powerful about we we now find we're finding with the, the science now that the kind of the intimate relationship between our nervous system and the breath. And so if we shallow breathe which often habitually we are in modern civilization, that we then energize and uh, aliven the, the, the nervous system. But if we perpetually stay in that state, then we are overusing the immune system. Uh, and so that can lead to heart disease and, and, and chronic stress. Slowing down, holding the breath, and you know, staying present in the body can, can you know, really be a grounding practice that then you bring into your everyday life where you're breathing slower, your organism is more efficient, and therefore you gain energy. And so that is why there's this kind of idea of Qigong, is that if you move with tranquility, either physically or the internal movement, 
then that leads to you having a chi circulation, tapping into the universal energy that powers our planet. And then uh, that leads to you living with vitality and energy throughout the rest of your day. Okay. Now, I hate to admit this, this is bad, but initially when I heard the word chi, I'm like, okay, you know, I don't believe this, right? Because it, 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 when I hear that, I think of those... Uh, Tai Chi masters that supposedly like push people away or repel people by force, you know, and I've just <laughs> gone, oh, you know, you gotta be kidding yeah. me, right? Yeah. But when you stop and think about it, it literally means en energy, like you said, and your cells by themselves have a lot of energy. And then you think how many cells you have. And then in a really weird video by Dr. Greger, he showed how basically by eating a, a salad, uh, the chlorophyll would be you know taken up into your your blood and it'd be transported around and when the sunlight would hit your skin it would go through and it'd hit the chlorophyll and it would actually still continue to produce energy as it's transferring through your body now we're talking negligible amounts but i mean that's still you know pretty amazing so the idea that there's an energy flow or transfer and plus i think they can even detect like a, a uh, i can't think of the word but so i, I no longer um I'm nearly as skeptical. I'm still skeptical about <laughs> those people. Yes. But yes, yes. The general idea, I don't think, is um, that crazy when you think about it. it. It actually, I think there could be something there. So it's fascinating. Yeah. Have you found any um, application of that? Yeah. I mean, I, I've been on a similar journey to yourself. I mean, I kind of grew up atheist. And, and when I talk about Chi, I'm, I like, I'm, I'm, I don't have enough information to kind of confirm some of the kind of the Chinese specifics on how it works. But like at a basic level, we know that even this us is energy and, and can manifest as, as physical matter, but actually deep down it is just waves and energy. And so, you know, we don't have to think about chi as some then other extra thing. It can just be the energy that um, is, you know, obviously all around us and through living through us. We, we you know everything kind of lives off the sun we eat plants uh, which give us energy and the and the plants photosynthesize so yeah i mean it, that is a basic reality that energy animates the universe uh, and so we can think about kind of qigong either metaphorically and so that is you know being present in our bodies and kind of connecting with the fact that there is energy all throughout nature and we can kind of be present with that um, but also scientifically, like we can, we can, you know, oxygen gives us, uh, you know, allows us to live. And so if we can be more efficient at snatching oxygen with less breaths, and so we don't overload our nervous system, then again, that will give us energy. And we know that stress is related to the top six killers in civilization, you know, heart disease, cancer, all of these things. And so, you know, breathing exercises absolutely can give us energy because they de-stress us and, and they, they help us reconnect. And so, yeah, I, I certainly feel that, uh, you know, directly applying that uh, in, to my own life is that breathing is, is one of the main things that I've really found as a tool to use, you know, before coming out to China and starting this journey, if I had a problem, I would just think and think and think and think, and that would be the only option available to me. You know, like if I have something in the future I'm worrying about, I'll, think through every potentiality long beyond on the point of so i'm just looping around and continuing to stress myself out another way of being that's available to us is the breath and so coming back into the present coming back and appreciating that the body has an intelligence that can help guide us even in the present moment and we can be spontaneous and effective at the same time and so with the breath it's just a simple, I, I would even just do a single breath. And that reminds me that, okay, I can re-enter into this looping or I can just, you know, reconnect with my body intelligence and then move from my center, which, which I have found has been a very powerful uh, kind of tool for me to use. Okay. I, I can't even begin to describe how many people have told me through different means and different applications, the importance of taking a breath, whether it's to calm down before going out to do a performance or, or it's just, it's amazing the, the overlap it has to all kinds of different people. So I hope people don't disregard that and look at it a little further. 
One of the things you mentioned, and there was the, the symbol that I think we're all familiar with, which is the yin yang symbol. Um, I absolutely love that symbol because within that symbol, you've got one end that's bigger than the other, you know, head to tail type of thing. And it, it, my understanding from what I've been told is that they go into each other, that it's, it's not like, it's a, not a duality that's split. It's not, you know, like good, bad type of thing. It, it's that the good transitions into the bad and the bad transitions into the good. And then within each one of those, you've got, let's just use yang, you've got a, a little dot, which is actually yin in there. So there's some of both in each. And to me, it's an amazing symbol. I'm sure when you were at the uh, academy there that you guys delved into that, could you speak a little bit about uh, yin and yang and its application to your life, I guess? Yes. Yeah, so I've yeah got a yin yang here. I don't know if this is going to be a podcast as well, but um, just just for for, so for some viewership, we, we can have it with us. And yeah, so the yin yang is actually more, it's certainly more ubiquitous than Taoism. So, so it is kind of the symbol that emerged from what we call Taoism now. I mean, actually, in, in those days, the yin yang was a macro concept. It's kind of fundamental to the Chinese way of thinking and, and not just a Taoist concept. But certainly in Taoism, they, they talk about it um, an awful lot. Um, and, and so, yeah, the yin-yang depicts a pair of opposites. The, the white is yang. And if you think about your white fang rhymes with yang, you now know that white is, is, is yang and then yin is black. And so, yeah, something to note about these is trying to depict the relationship between opposites and, and our, our existence is made up of the rhythmic alternation between opposites. So, you know, we've talked about inhale and exhale, night and day, on and off. All of our computers, every bit of technology allowing me to connect with you right now is based on just two numbers, zero and one, a binary on and off. And that kind of the combination of those pairings leads to the, the vast uh, compl complexity that allows you know, us to, to talk from the other side of the world. And so that is actually even our nervous system um, our, our neurons fire with a binary on and off, like is it is or is it ain't, uh, as Alan Watts likes to say. And, and so understanding the relationship between opposites is really important um, because then we can begin to understand you know, come, some of the key features of existence. And the Taoists in chapter two, the Tao Te Ching, we talked about chapter one, which is, you know, there's a mystery. The Tao that can be named is not the eternal Tao. But if we start to explore it, then we can learn more about it. That's basically chapter one. And then immediately in chapter two, already was straight into the yin yang. And uh, Lao Tzu, the, the author of the, of the Tao Te Ching, makes the basic point that you can't have good without some idea of what evil is. You can't have an idea of someone being beautiful without an idea of what ugliness is. You can't have an inhale without an exhale unless you hold your breath forever. You can't have on without off. And so although we may think that good and evil are opposing and right and wrong are opposing, this suggests that actually they are interdependent. They are, they are mutually arising. They come into being together. And so that means that they can't be separated. And also that the one isn't necessarily superior than the other, because if they are both needed, then, you know, there's no way that you could have light without dark, uh, because, you know, you wouldn't have an, an idea for, for for light, you know, if, if we lived in a purely bright universe, there'd be no contrast for which as, for, for us to know what this light was. It'd just be, uh, you know, an undistinguishable part of our existence. Similarly, with life and death, death, deafness is, is another one. But um, you know, we can't have some idea. If we were to live forever, we wouldn't have an idea of being alive because there'd be no idea of us not being here. And so. Yeah, there's kind of a philosophical idea, but very instructive for our own lives as well. And so for me, for example, with my body, I was learning Tai Chi and I arrived at the mountain. I had this very unique and special opportunity to be learning with, with Master Gu, doing Tai Chi, but my body wasn't responding. And so I had injuries in my, my knees and my, my feet and my wrists. And I was kind of feeling sorry for myself and decided to train anyway and just try and go through the pain and ignore it. Um, but if we remember the, the, the wisdom of the yin yang, we are both good and bad are natural parts of the human experience. Like 
pain and anxiety and feeling down. These are all natural parts of the human experience. Uh, and so we can actually ask, what is this teaching us? What, what is the lesson going on here? Because the pain in my knees wasn't my body punishing me. It was, it was feedback from the greater harmony of my body telling me that you know, I was doing my practice wrong and I needed to change something. And so we can repress and ignore that pain or we can accept it and see what it teaches us. us. And that's true you know, for mental health as well. Like I had this idea that I was messed up or weak for feeling anxious. But again, if we remember that, that anxiety is a natural part of the human experience, then again, it's okay, what, 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 what is going on here? And what can this teach me? Because it may be that my anxiety is based on me making erroneous connections between things that don't actually exist, in which case I need to learn more about myself and, and how reality works. And so that again is a gift. Uh, and that is, you know, my story is I had my mental health crisis and that led me on a journey of discovery, which has made me, you know, a more resilient person today. Maybe that that anxiety really is telling you something like, okay, you need to pay attention to this. Uh, and that was kind of the natural feedback. If there was danger out in, in you know, as we were hunter gatherers, then we better bloody listen to that feedback or else we're going to die and get eaten by a lion. So either way you, you gain. Uh, and so, yeah, the, 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 that again fits into the general outlook of Taoism, which is an accepting uh, and a compassionate uh, philosophy. Because, you know, if we realize that supposedly evil people are actually an inseparable part of, of reality, then the goal doesn't become eliminating them, it becomes understanding them. And that isn't an argument for stasis and the world never changing and just accepting everything as, as it is. But instead, acceptance creates the space for change. Because, you know, if someone is critical towards you, you're not going to listen to what they say because, you know, you, they've offended uh, your ego and your identity. Whereas if, if you feel like someone has the space to accept who you are, then you're more able to kind of move um, towards that person and towards a more compassionate way of being. So the yin yang has an awful lot of wisdom. Uh, and it, yeah, I, I likewise find it a very comforting uh, diagram that I often refer back to. There's a, a lot of poets and other people over the years who basically made the point that uh, knowing that you can do evil is kind of like the basis of knowing that you're good. And, and because mm. you, you realize that it's in there and that you know it's capable. So it, it's, I think it's a great thing because it's amazingly sim simple in that it can be kind of generally understood, but then it's also amazingly complex and, and very deep and broad. So it's, it's a neat symbol. Now, here's a, a really, I think it relates to what you said about not sitting around um, or accepting it, but this concept is really difficult for me to comprehend, which is Wu Wei. Yes. Can you go into that for us? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So this is... Yeah, one of the kind of key concepts in Taoism. So Wu Wei translates literally as non-action. And the Taoists talk about it in, in terms of nature. So I talked about nature earlier being siran, self-sowing. And you know, if we look at a tree, for example, a conscious being that's maybe 300 years old, incredibly strong and big, um, you know, a miracle of nature. Uh, and it doesn't seem to be doing anything in particular. It's not like contriving to be the perfect tree. It's not worrying about what sort of leaves it's gonna grow that year. It, nothing is necessarily done consciously and yet nothing is left undone. And so this is one of the key insights of the Taoists, again, is that they see that nature is spontaneous. Things happen by themselves and Wu Wei is, is one uh, way of understanding nature more generally which is, yeah, non-contrived action is one way you can translate it, uh, or spontaneous action, effortless action. And so the human consciousness is an interesting one because, again, yes, it's a manifestation of nature, but also we can get in our own way. We become too self-aware that we start second-guessing who we are, what we're supposed to be doing here, and, you know, what's the meaning of it all. And so Wu Wei... Is, is a yin yang pairing so so there's the kind of way action and but we often don't realize that not doing can also be an effective 
way of being. And so, you know, some practical examples of, of how to apply it in, in daily life is a, a job interview. So, you know, the way, the action would be preparing lots of interview questions and making sure that you had everything prepared. And inevitably you'll get in to the interview, they'll ask you questions that you didn't prepare. And you have two options at that, at, at that point to, you know, stress out because they've asked you something outside of your comfort zone or to practice non-action and trusting the spontaneity of your body to, to navigate this new challenge. And so saying something like, that's an interesting question I haven't thought about before. Give yourself a, a, a breath to, to have a break and then say, well, this is what's coming up for me right now. And then, you know, allowing, it's that trust really. Another great example of trust is, uh, I've got a friend who works for the BBC Wildlife um, you know, nature documentary team. And he went out to Sweden to record flying squirrels. Now, when flying squirrels are first born, they're born up in the nest 30 meters in, in the trees. And eventually they have to get out. And so, you know, the mum is going out every day to co collect food and bringing it back. But eventually the kids looking down out of their nests have to eventually jump. And so, you know, imagine being a human in that situation. You've never flown before. <laughs> and you're 30 meters up, up uh, in the canopy. And eventually, and, you know, my friend captures th these amazing moments of, you know, the, the squirrels are still hesitating, they're still nervous, but eventually they have to trust their nature and they jump. And of course, you know, the, the wind catches them and they glide uh, and they land safely. And, and so sometimes we have to make that leap of faith that we don't have to have everything planned up in our heads, that we actually can trust ourselves to be effective in the present moment without having planned everything. And so it's not that Wu Wei is this never do anything again. And, you know, that relates to what we were saying earlier, but instead it, it is offering us another way of being. Uh, and actually more often than not, we can just using the breath, come back to the present moment and, and check, you know, am I overacting right now? And, and what would non-action look like in this situation? Uh, and, and yeah, that again, I've found that very powerful for me with my anxiety is that rather than having to, you know, say dating and trying to say the right things to um, a person that I like is just staying present and, and just connecting. Because, you know, in our conversation here, I'll say something and a thought arises in your head and that will trigger something for you to say. And, and likewise, like uh, we don't have to plan conversation uh, and it's only when we stress out that we then suddenly think, oh no, I have to be stuck in here and having to plan everything when actually that there's other ways of being available to us. Okay. I think that makes a lot of sense. And I know one of the things I asked you beforehand was if we could um, share some favorite uh, Lao Tzu or uh, Zhuang Zhou uh, quotes. And we'll go back to that because those are two very key figures. Um, but the one that relates to this wave comment is a, uh, a good traveler has no fixed plans and is not intent upon arriving. And it took me the longest time in life to um, figure that out on my own and accept it. And yeah. now I end up having probably as much fun or more fun. And I may never actually get to where it was. I initially set off to just because I found something along the way that was fun or before yeah. I would never have stopped to enjoy it. So, yes, yes, yes. Uh, I'll, I'll butcher it because I haven't done this in a while, but um, um, T.S. Eliot's The Four Quartets, he has this idea of may we never stop our exploration. Um, but when we do stop exploring, we'll be to return to the same place, but see it for the first time. Something along those lines. So it, even in the present moment, where as compared to externalizing our aspirations as, you know, I'll be a complete human being once I get uh, to this place that I've arbitrarily decided. Uh, There's kind of the concept in Taoism of returning. Uh, and actually we can return to our everyday life uh, and our routine with new fresh eyes. And that is because the world, you know, is constantly changing that the ancient Greeks and the Buddhists have lots of stuff about this as well, is that, you know, any sort of plan that you have about your destination inevitably will be swept uh, out the way by the currents of existence. And so, you know, we can get down about that and feel 
uh, bad about not reaching where we thought we should be, or we can, you know, work with the world. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's a kind of a metaphor that Alan Watts uses, which is that we're all in the river of the Tao, we're on the river of life. And some people see themselves as they realize that they can be carried by the energy of the world. And so they you know, set a raft up, maybe have some beers and float down the river and, and enjoy themselves because they realize that, you know, they're being carried. Others, however, are fighting it and have this kind of illusion that swimming upstream is going to get them anywhere. But in reality, they're still getting taken down by the river. And, and so, yeah, Taoism, as, as a, again, as a general concept, is non-forcing, trying to live without resistance. Uh, and one of these things is, is we kind of have contrived ideas of what our life should look like. And sure, you know, like having ambitions and goals is, is important um, and, and also is one way for us to, you know, uh, direct the energy that we have, which is, you know, obviously a good thing. Um, but also it can be like having the blinkers on, you know, like horses have blinkers which prevent them seeing behind them. You, if anyone does any running, like I used to run for my personal best and I'd have an app on, I'd be timing myself and I could run through a forest and not see anything. I would not like stop to listen to the birds. I would not see any of the trees and maybe you know, a friend would be walking through the forest and I wouldn't see them. And so that purpose, that goal narrows down our attention so that we actually miss a lot of the opportunities that come into the world. And so, yeah, a, a, a good traveler has no destination is not fixed on arriving is that we can see our life uh, as, a, as a journey. Uh, and, you know, we are all on the pathless path, the wayless way of life uh, and so one consequence of that is play and we see that throughout nature you know kittens and, and puppies and children and birds play and adults we somehow lose this idea that we can be spontaneous and play in, in the given moment uh, and and again that play is you know by definition not presetting what's going to happen it's okay some, some, you know, as a child, you're 10 years old and you've got imaginary friends and you're talking about your imaginary friends with each other. You're just going to vibe off what each other are going for. You're not going to have some contrived idea of the characteristics of the imaginary friends. Uh, and so that is accessible to us, too, uh, is that we can play uh, and see our life as a journey rather than being fixed on, you know, the arbitrary destination, which unfortunately is a mirage and we never arrive and then beat ourselves up for it. Uh, so, yeah, again, it's, it's, it's about being able to hold both, both the goals and the aspirations, which, which are good, but also really remembering that the, our, our life is not about reaching there. Instead, it's about the journey and enjoying the, the way. Your quote about seeing things, uh, you know, from a different angle or whatever is so true, because when you start to learn about how you actually perceive something, so you could have a bunch of people looking at the exact same photograph. And because of how you perceive the world and how you view the world and everything, you, you will pull things out of there and you'll, you'll ignore the, the other parts where somebody else may focus on some other parts. So you, you may not literally see the same thing and yet you're all looking at the same thing. And, and that, that to me is just mind boggling. But again, yes. it comes back to that because you're, you're allowing yourself to look at things that you wouldn't have otherwise looked at, which I think is really great. This this isn't really the, the format for it, but in a, um, a brief example, can you describe the importance of those, those two people, the Zhangzhou and um, Lao Tzu and their role in Taoism? And granted, it's a very broad subject, but kind of condemned. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so Taoism emerged from a time of turmoil much more intense than ours. So it was known as the Warring States period, 500 BC, ancient China. And the turmoil demanded new ideas to help return the land to peace and uh, for people's hearts to return to peace. And one group of thinkers, which we now call the Taoists, they turned to nature as their teacher and came up with a very powerful set of ideas uh, to help us navigate the world uh, and to live in harmony with nature and humanity. So who we call the Taoists today is, as I said earlier, that, that they are there's been kind of a, a lineage dating back to prehistory of shamans, people who, you know, the wise people of the forests, who then 
would orally transmit their wisdom over the generations. And then in 500 BC, in this warring states period, a philosopher called Lao Tzu um, was a librarian at a king's court, and then eventually decided to give up uh, the ways of civilization and retire. And in that process, he, he wrote the Tao Te Ching, which wasn't just you know, his own insights, although obviously a lot of his own insights would have come into it, but instead the kind of accumulation and the distillation of all of this wisdom that was being uh, talked about um, at that time. And so, yeah, that person's called Lao Tzu, and we still don't have specific evidence for his existence, but nor did we for Aristotle and some of the other Greek philosophers. So I think it's okay to say that Lao Tzu was a philosopher. Certainly, you know, someone wrote it. So, yeah, you know, the story comes... And, and I find it instructive to, to think about kind of him as, you know, what's Lao Tzu trying to tell me when I read the Tao Te Ching? Then kind of coming around 100 years later is Zhuangzi, who, who is kind of the second most famous Taoist, very, you know, aware of the Tao Te Ching and, and will kind of use direct quotations from it. And, and he differs because he, as I said earlier, lives in civilization. And Zhuangzi has a fantastic approach to, tell, to uh, philosophy, and that is stories and parables and humor, and often uh, really, uh, yeah, silly and outrageous stories, um, which, you know, there, there are some, some many good ones. One being, uh, you know, him talking about relativity and, and, and the yin yang. He says, you know, everyone around me in the court says that Mrs. Lee is the most beautiful woman in all of China. But if you asked a mudfish swimming on the, on the ocean floor, if she was beautiful, I think it would swim away in disgust. And so, you know, who's got the right idea of what beauty really is? So, you know, just fun little things like that. Of He interweaves these kind of images and parables in, into his philosophy. And then there's, yeah, the third most famous Taoist, which is Lietze. And again, continuing the storytelling tradition, uh, and kind of reflecting how, you know, in the courts that th they would tell stories and they would have discussions under trees, telling stories to one another. That was kind of one of the main me mechanisms of uh, transmitting the Taoist wisdom. Um, but yeah, I, I would say that kind of Lao Tzu and the Tao Te Ching and then the Zhuangzi are the kind of the two key texts that actually make Taoism very accessible as a philosophy because there's not like a big canon to complete. If you have those two books, as well as kind of some explanatory ones, you've got a long way already. Okay, I'll have to look up the third one because I don't remember whether I read that book or not. Um, what I always liked about Zhuang Shou is that he was, to me, it almost seemed like he was making fun of um, Confucian you know, thinking and stuff. And if I could be wrong, but was he the one who came up with the, the butcher um, cutting the, uh, the cow, if I remember right? He, he had a lot yeah. of good ones. The, the quote I liked and I, I purposely wrote down was that, um, so bear with me as I read this, okay? Yes. <laughs> the fish trap exists because of the fish. Once you've gotten the fish, you can forget the trap. The rabbit snare exists because of the rabbit. Once you've gotten the rabbit, you can forget the snare. Words exist because of meaning. Once you've gotten the meaning, you can forget the words. Where can I find a man who has forgotten words so I can talk with them? Yeah. <laughs> That, that has always had a lot of meaning and value to me. So he had a lot of really neat things to say. And like you said, he had some rather uh, funny ways of putting it too. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I love that. Like, find me a man who's, who, yeah. Well, say the wording again. Well, the it, last basically, I think it was something like, find me a man who um, has forgotten words. So yes. I can talk with him. Can <laughs> yeah, brilliant. Yeah, the, the Buddhists also have, the kind of the, the the metaphor of the finger pointing at the moon. So you know, again, it's these these words which help us understand reality. But the Tao that can be named is not the eternal Tao. Like there's there's you can't compartmentalize reality with the intellect. Like we can actually have knowing without being able to explain it. So you know, like love as an emotion. You know, we can know love, but can we explain how? You know what what love really is. And even with our hands, like if we open and close our hands, that is something that we know how to do. But explaining it, even our best science 
even if we can explain the intricacies of every muscle, like the consciousness that uh, allows this to happen is, is a mystery. And, and so, you know, words are very useful. And again, it's, it's, the, it's this yin yang balance. It's not about just forgetting all books and, and, and never using your intellect again, but instead it's remembering that, okay, this is like a fish trap. Like you gotta, you gotta let go of the trap. Uh, and uh, yeah, the words are guidance, but ultimately, you've got to experience the world for yourself and have that kind of subconscious experiential knowing, which is ultimately deeper and communicated through feeling rather than the intellect. And then when it's, when you feel those aha moments and that kind of sense of connection as a, as a feeling, that's when it integrates into the story of who you are that then affects the decisions that you make and, and the way that you live. So long as it's just an abstract intellectual idea, it's a nice idea to have, but won't you know become part of the story of who you are and, and help you navigate life. And like your your finger example, once you've learned the concept, there's really no point in continuing to stare at the finger because you're <laughs> or the words in that case, because you yeah. now understand what they're trying to tell you. Yeah. Um, so we, I think we've got like a, a broad general idea of Taoism, but going back to the school and master Gu. Uh, what did your daily schedule look like? Is I, I remember one of the comments that made me laugh was that like when it was cold or, or wet, you weren't exactly looking forward to getting out of bed. <laughs> so yeah, tell me what a, a normal day looked like. Yes. So yeah. So I mean, the daily schedule: you get up at six thirty, you do some meditation, have breakfast, tai chi for two hours in the morning, and then have a break and uh, yeah, go, often go off on walks in the afternoon. Come back for tai chi training in the afternoon. And then yeah, evenings could be music or just reading and, and yeah, very simple way of living. And that's very nourishing as a consequence. The weather is interesting. So in, in Europe, we have the, the Gulf Stream, which is warm air from the Caribbean, which keeps our temperature relatively stable. So Britain, are kind of our temperature varies from zero degrees centigrade to, to 30. Uh, whereas in China, I found myself in the winter without any heating in minus 15 degrees centigrade, which is you know well below freezing, almost Siberian temperatures. And so, yeah, there's kind of three foot of snow that's just fallen. I'm lying in bed and I've got five blankets on me and just really unwilling to start the day. And that was a very interesting uh, uh, battle with my underminer because my underminer was not happy about this. He's like, George, you know, you've got this unique opportunity to be on the mountain. You need to get out. You need to be, you know, doing things. Instead, I'd be like my my gloved fingers on the computer, like procrastinating because I was bed bound because it was so cold. Uh, and yeah, it, it, it was tough, but certainly taught me a lot. And, and again, the resilience of the body and uh, what is accessible to us. And I, I was always uh, amazed you know, my breath control wasn't good on, on the first trip uh, at, at how few items of clothing Master Gu wore compared to me. And I, I would be like shivering. Um, but Master Gu had kind of mastered his breath or the ability to live without heating um, in, those, in those cold temperatures. The contrast with the summer, uh, you know, 40, 45 degrees uh, without heating, uh, which is yeah, incredibly hot, uh, sorry, without air conditioning. Uh, and that comes with this own challenges as well as all the insects that absolutely love those temperatures and and the kind of the abundance of biting animals that uh, you may interact with um but yeah again it's you know homo sapiens were thought to come from the african savannah around 200,000 million uh, 200,000 years ago and we've since dispersed throughout the whole world in so many different uh, locations and landscapes and one of the interesting things about my journey and journey to the east is, you know, seeing Siberia and seeing China and, and the rainforest there. Uh, and again, it's just the resilience of, of who we are. We, ha we have this latent power that's within all of us that is accessible to all of us. And we only really tap into, you know, 1% of it, um, which, yeah, is a nice thing to remember when we feel that something is beyond our capabilities. Okay. Hey, there's also one of your videos where you had Master Gui, he was talking about the times of the day. Um, like he was making a 
point, I think it was five to seven in the morning was a good time to get up and, and move. Is there actually like a, a cycle throughout the day and does that change throughout the year or how does that work? Yeah, so there's the heaven and the, the an hour in the Chinese clock is actually two hours for them. So you'll be testing me on my Chinese now. I think it's the, a, a sh, uh, is, is one of, of these segments. So there's 12 hours in the day or 12 sh in the day. And each one of these um, periods of time corresponds to a different organ and a different activity. So yeah, as you said, five to seven a.m. is a great time for your bowels. That's when your intestines are most active, and so that's a good time to go for a number two. And then yeah, I think the next one is heart, and so that's a good time, kind of seven to nine, to start activating. And the next one is stomach. You, yeah, breakfast between seven and nine, and then nine to eleven is activity. I, I can't quite remember all of the different areas. Right. Um, but yeah, more generally, there's, you know, the ex exploration of the Tao is about understanding our nature. Uh, and one of the, the things we see in nature is cycles and the, the plants, they, you know, they will drop their leaves in the autumn and then, um, you know, turn a sunflower would turn throughout the day to face the sun. Uh, and the Taoists believe that similarly, that there are rhythms that if we follow, then we will, you know, work in keeping with our nature. And as a consequence, you know, live with more energy and live for longer and so yeah they have specifics such as that kind of heavenly timetable uh, which then can be instruction to help you live long and live well does that come from Taoism, or is it like a traditional chinese medicine type of application or, or do you know because uh, yeah i believe that's traditional chinese medicine so that's not just Taoism, uh, and they feed into each other so you know the, the traditional chinese medicine is absolutely overlapped with Taoist medicine, you know, chi, meridians, acupoints, the basic conception of, of the human being being uh, jing qi shen. Uh, so jing is a kind of our, our essence. Think about it as the DNA, but also corresponds to the body. Then there's qi, the energy that animates us. And then there's the shen, the spirit. Uh, so these are known as the three treasures, jing qi shen, body, energy, and spirit. And so the kind of the, the, the that relates to the cosmology of Taoism, but also the kind of the medicine as well. Uh, and so, yeah, many of the concepts overlap. To, to wrap this up, because I don't want to take up too much of your time, um, from all your experiences in China, Wudong, what has kind of stuck with you the most? Yeah, I, I would say that curiosity uh, and the, yeah, the ability to, Go with the flow. I mean, that's a that's a, a cliche in Taoism, but the yeah, coming back to what we talked about recently, like so much of my life and the opportunities that I've got has come from not having a set plan and so sort of moving with what the world gives me. And yeah, having that curiosity about how we work, our nature and our relationship with nature more generally can help us, you know, understand life and navigate it. And I have found that that has brought new opportunities to me. And so if I was to say something, you know, for people watching is that, yeah, just having that curiosity about yourself. And if you've been watching this, then, then you will do. You know, this is a wonderful asset that you have. And so, you know, continue to, to, to grow and to explore uh, and to yeah, be open to new possibilities because, you know, you'll find that things come to you that you weren't expecting that you know give you experiences that nourish your your life that's an absolutely beautiful way to to wrap this up george thank you very much for joining me I appreciate it and it was great thank you the pleasure is mine and, and thank you for everything that you're doing